Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, uh, both our online audience and our audience here in SOAS. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for a much anticipated event. Um, this is actually the first event uh, that we are having since the sad news last week, uh, the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. And as she was our patron uh, of the Royal African Society for 65 years, um, we decided we would go ahead with this event because we were very keen that it should go on. I'm sure she would have wanted it to go ahead, but just as a mark of respect, we'll spend just a few moments in silence before we begin. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Nick Westcott. I'm the director of the Royal African Society, and uh, it's our pleasure to be able to provide a platform to launch this remarkable book published in the African Arguments series, which we sort of co-sponsor with the IAI, um, who are also represented here uh, and published by Hearst, uh, to give them a plug as well. I think there will be some copies available to buy afterwards, uh, all being well, if we can find some tables to put them on. Um, so please do. Uh, and the last weeks have given us, or last week, have given us an idea of some of the challenges that are faced when a long lived and long ruling figure departs the scene. Zimbabwe's case was rather different from Britain's case this past week. But it has faced some major issues, and that is really the core of the book that David Moore has written and the discussion that we will have tonight. Um, I will pass in a minute uh, to the moderator to introduce the panel and the book. Um, but just before I do so, this is only one of many things that the Royal African Society does. And to just quickly give you a heads up, we have recently published a report into Africa in the British educational curriculum, uh, published by the uh, All Party Parliamentary Group for Africa, designed to try and ensure that Africa is better represented in the British school curriculum. I commend this to you, it's available online and we are keen to spread word of it. It has some very practical suggestions um, and we are lobbying for them to be adopted in schools and the curriculum throughout. Uh, secondly, uh, we will welcome the CEO of Standard Chartered before the COP27 Climate Summit in Sharm El Sheikh uh, later this year who will wishes to uh, address the issue of financing a sustainable future for Africa. And uh, that will be on the 5th of October, and there should be notice of it on our website. Uh, thirdly, Film Africa Festival will take place on the 29th of October to the 6th of November here in London and online, thanks to the BFI um, online platform and it will have a fantastic collection of the latest African film. Please don't miss it. Uh, and lastly, in the middle of that festival, we will be celebrating our 120th anniversary with a major uh, celebration that will take place at the Shard, in fact. And again, details of that are on our website. So if you haven't already joined the Royal African Society, strongly recommended you do so, because then you get the discount rate, early bird rate for coming to our party which will be a very good party. Uh, I can now uh, hand the floor over to uh, our moderator of the evening, Adam Habib, I think known to many of you already, director of the, Royal, of the School of Oriental African Studies, SOAS University of London, um, and uh, well-established uh, commentator on all things African, knows Zimbabwe from close quarters over many years. Um, and we're very grateful to you for finding time to moderate this panel because it's such an important subject. So Adam, over to you and thank you very much. So thank you, Nick. Uh, you know, colleagues, my apologies for the delay. Uh, my only excuse is that I was part of a board meeting and I was trying to scramble out of that board meeting for the last uh, 30 minutes. So my uh, apologies for the delay. Uh, we do have 
uh, five colleagues who are going to be respondents in many ways uh, to David. The way I suggest we do this is we will kick off uh, after a minute or two uh, with, with David speaking to the book, the substance of the argument, perhaps some reflections on the contemporary issues playing out in Zimbabwe, uh, perhaps for about 10 minutes. And then in line with the list of uh, respondents that I have used, uh, Ahmad Zaripi, uh, obviously Tirash, Mandipa, and Roger, uh, three of whom are, as I uh, assume, online. Is that true? Do we have uh, used uh, Ahmad Zaripi and, and Roger online? Can we guarantee that? They are, yeah. they are online. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, okay, so we'll bring them at the appropriate time. I was going to make a suggestion that each of them would respond to uh, for about three, three or four minutes each, uh, which will give you 10. We'll take another, you know, four, three or four of them take us another 15, 25 minutes, and then we'll open up uh, uh, the conversation uh, with all of you. I perhaps should, I can't resist the opportunity by at least making one remark at the outset of this conversation. And it seems to me that we've got to start asking the question, not uh, is how did Mugabe survive 40 years? Uh, what is it? And it's one thing. And what is it about that survival that speaks about how we need to do things differently in structuring governance uh, and enabling development, uh, not only on the African continent, but across the developing world. What are the lessons of the transitions of that first generation of post-colonial experiences that we need to learn from so that we don't continue to uh, belabor and struggle with the challenges uh, of development across the, the, the developing world? And that for me is, it seems to me, the subject of the challenge. I will say this. Um, having spent 18 months in the UK, I'm now increasingly struck by what I've always assumed to be the challenges of the developing world increasingly manifest themselves in significant parts of the North with all of the, the challenges that come with it. Uh, and uh, it is astonishing for, some, for somebody coming from South Africa with some of the challenges around uh, load shedding, what in South Africa is, is called load shedding, which is power cuts. Uh, and suddenly the debate has emerged in the middle of London that, that there possibly could be power cuts in, the, in, in deep winter uh, in, in the UK. That kind of debate would not have been possible a mere 18 months ago, I would imagine. And it is something that we've got to understand about the challenges of our world, the transnational character of these challenges and our need to develop really universal solutions to these transnational challenges of our moment. So I, I say that by way of introduction, David, because I do think that while this book and the reflections of, uh, are focused in Zimbabwe, there are fundamental lessons to be learned for where our world is at this moment. And I'll stop there, ask David to take it from there. And then of course, I'll come to each uh, one of the respondents, David. Thank you, Adam, you completely derailed me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> big problems from little places. But I think in a sense, the book does look at one person, which is a sort of micro analysis and flows in and out. Thank you, Mindy. Um, flows in and out to uh, larger structures and systems and processes and, and historical moments. First of all, a few thanks around um, the table, especially to Stephanie, who has to be one of the best editors around, diplomatic, quick, efficient, responds to letters as if you're the only person writing something and who knows how many are going on at the same time. Thank you, Stephanie, very much. And. Um, uh, some old friends. Um, Henry, it was 1984 when I, Henry Bernstein, when I presented my first ever international 
paper at a conference at Kiel, a rope conference. I was on my way to do field work in Zimbabwe, and I was probably the only person around the panel who had actually, you know, being a PhD wet under the years, had actually presented a paper. So Henry had read the paper. And uh, it was eight o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning. Everybody was hungover. And Henry said, you need a theory of nationalism because it was kind of like, you know, Polancy and petty bourgeois politicians. You need a theory of nationalism. That was a paper. Now I'm presenting a book like how many years later? And I don't think we've got a real theory of nationalism here yet. Um, but it's part of the story. Um, and... Um, uh, who's out there? Uh, oh, Adam, I think I've known you for a while. UKZN days, we were marching against Big Pharma in the HIV AIDS days. And um, we were together at, at, at UJ, UKZN, many, many places around, around the world and now here. So thanks very much for, for coming in. Um, Roger and I, I think, yeah, uh, you and Roger and I were at my inaugural lecture in 2010. And Roger said something like that. You thought you thought you heard something pessimistic. Wait till you hear my discussion. He was he was a, he was a discussant at that time. So Roger, don't be too pessimistic now. Mandy and Tanesh, thank you so much. And used out there and Hama. Anyway, um, all protocol observed. Is that what they say in South Africa? Uh, lessons to be learned. Um, and I I think I, I'm going to kind of seg you into a part of the book which has relevance to discussions about the Commonwealth, about empire, about British foreign policy, uh, then and now, in the 1970s when uh, Robert Mugabe was learning how to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that the big thing of the book is the way that Robert Mugabe learned how to survive is the way that also led to his demise. So, in the 70s, Robert Mugabe rose to the top of the slippery pole of ZANU politics by playing off one faction, be that generational, um, na nation, tribe, ethnicity, uh, ideological, global contradictions, the Cold War. He played them off against each other so that somehow he got on top. And he learned how to do that. And he learned how to do that very, very, very well until it kind of sputtered out as, as he eventually died a political death and then died a rather ignoble, ignoble death uh, a year or so later. Um, in the broader sense, a lesson to be learned is feudalism takes a long time to die. Here, <laughs> uh, you know, the, there's going to be great new debates about the royal family, about the role of the monarchy. Um, the great queen who was able to, you know, according to media, was able to, to balance all these, uh, the, these, these balls very nicely. Um, Roger also wrote a nice piece in the conversation recently about the monarchy um, and empire and the Commonwealth in it. So I'll, I'll just take you back a little bit to, to talk about the 1970s. The 1970s were a much much different time, I would think, in the Foreign Office, uh, in the Labour Party, in, uh, in, 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 in all those sort of apparatuses of state than they are now. Um, you know, hyper-liberalism hadn't come into play yet. It was the golden age of capitalism. It was the Cold War. Uh, Zimbabwe was one of the last of the colonial um, handovers. South Africa, of course, was was last. Um, so I, I end up finding this character, it turns out to be a bit of a John le Carré book, um, who did become an MI6 um, agent with a lot of responsibility in Southern Africa. But if you look at this guy's biography, it doesn't look like the normal foreign office civil servant. So Dennis Grennan, um, I traced um, through the archives and, and, and various sources, perhaps epitomized to an extreme um, changes that have been going on in the foreign office um, since, um, uh, since it, well, it used to be called sort of a, a, 
a playground for the for, for the aristocracy, the Foreign Affairs Office back in the 1860s. Um, but it had changed a bit. So Dennis was a real working class lad. Father was a street fighter in a in a, um, a poor area of, of Manchester. His mother was an Irish Labour Party official. Um, he was so poor that he couldn't even get a grammar school scholarship because the cartilage around his his knees was was uh, was was non-existent because of malnutrition. And he became a friend of Harold Wilson, uh, helped run his campaign, hated the communists because the communists were trashing. Uh, the labor offices in in Manchester instead of the Tories' offices. So he was, what, I guess, what would, what was the sort of phrase for working class left wingers like that, where they called right wing uh, um, um, working class? I'm not sure. Anyway, he he got a scholarship to Ruskin College and met a lot of African nationalists, including Julius Neri, um, many Kenyan nationalists, and he started up this foundation called the Ariel Foundation. Um, after being president of the Students Union, the National President's Student Union, and being a key uh, um, actor in the process which developed the local authority um, scholarships for kids to go to university. So he had a good, uh, 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 he was a good guy, actually. <laughs> and so after he, he met a lot of people like um, uh, the African nationalists at Ruskin College, and he decided this, to set up this Ariel Foundation, which was a, a bipartisan organization to challenge the far right, like the Monday Club, who were the, the Ian Smith supporters and so on. He ended up being um, in, in uh, Zambia, working with uh, Kenneth Kawunda, along with uh, Fabian economists like Michael Faber and um, um, Richard uh, Oakshot, who saved the Zambian nationalization process millions of pounds by getting the numbers right when the nationalization process was going on. So you had a lot of these left wing Labour Party Fabians in in Zambia helping out um, um, England and and uh, and Zambia. So he met Robert Mugabe at, in Zambia when Robert Mugabe was in jail in Salisbury, he went down to him and said, how can I help you? And Robert said, please look after my wife. She's not going to be happy in Rhodesia. She's not going to be even allowed to stay in Rhodesia. She doesn't want to go back to Ghana. This, this was Sally, his Ghanaian wife. So look after her. So Dennis Grennan, who eventually became MI6, um, and, and Harold Wilson's and even Margaret Thatcher's man in South Africa, looked after Sally Mugabe in his house for three years. And I can't, I can't imagine anybody in that situation doing a thing like that today. Uh, is there even, so? Do, are there social democrats today? I don't know, you know, <laughs> kind of like, because neoliberalism has become so hegemonic, we don't even think of alternatives anymore. Thatcher was right. There has become no alternative, it's become hegemonic. So it's a completely different world uh, from the 70s until today. And, and so many people in, in the British system just didn't know what they wanted to get rid of Ian Smith. They didn't, you know, but there was a Cold War. Kissinger comes in and so on. So that's kind of uh, a global historical um, bit of the book that uh, that comes through. And I've decided my next research project, if anybody asks me, you don't have to ask me, will be to chase Sally Mugabe's ghost in London. Because, um, um, and Tony's helped me out on that a bit. There are people around here who have worked with Sally Mugabe as she was at the Africa Center. Dennis Grennan helped her get a job there. And she came here many times in the 1980s while Gakura Hundi was going on and she was a special guest of people like Ken Livingston and Linda Bellos. And she gave a lecture for the Marcus Garvey 100th birthday at, 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 at the Africa Center and so on. So that, I wanna find out more about that moment. Um, meanwhile, the book, the rest of the book, how am I doing? Do I have three minutes? Uh, About five. five. Okay. Uh, so this is not a biography of Mugabe. It started out to be a book about the coup, which was in the end, end of 2017. Ken Barlow, who was then with Zed Press, which was then linked with African Arguments, wrote a letter to me saying, what are you up to? And I wasn't quite sure what he was asking about, but it would, I guess he was asking me to write a book about the coup. So I started on that project. Um, but as it became apparent that um, Robert Mugabe was going to buy, die, um, I thought, well, you know, I've spent 
almost four decades uh, chugging around the archives, talking to people, going in and out of Zimbabwe, that I might have something interesting to say about this process. How, does, how did Robert Mugabe survive? What can we learn about how he survived and how his demise came about to, I don't think this is a policy book, uh, Adam, but I guess at the end of the day, it is, uh, it, it, it leads us to ask questions about how do you analyze that dialectic structure agency? Is there something called Mugabeism? Could we even think about, and I don't think I do it directly in the book, but I think as I've been uh, contemplating Adam's sort of questions is, can we get a theory of, of, of African political economic complexes that is quite general, that is, that is based on universal precepts? But of course, if you are a materialist using universal precepts, you're going to find out different things about different societies. Can we find enough similarities if we use that process in Africa as a whole to start thinking about a, a mode of political production that is unique, almost unique, instead of, you know, okay, this was feudalism. Well, the decolonial theorists, the post-colonial theorists have got us thinking about um, reconfiguring some of these perceptions, but I think a lot of them become a little bit too idealistic. So, um, if we think, and through my career, I've kind of come up with this glib perspective on development theory. It's the holy trinity, right? The father is primitive accumulation. How does something like capitalism develop, right? Whether it's indigenously or organically uh, um, um, evolved or whether it's coming in from outside, obviously, it's we we know the basic precepts of capitalism society and we know what it destroys and we know what it creates it's a process of creative destruction does it do this kind of thing in african social formation so we've got the father which is primitive accumulation and we've got the son which is nation state formation african states as we all know were created with the berlin conference and they're so artificial when what could have I mean, there's sort of a counterfactual here. What might have evolved with wars, with treaties, with, you know, what sort of Westphalia treaty might have evolved in Africa? What did evolve? We have nations. What are, what are nations? In Zimbabwe, of course, is there an Endebele nation? Did the Shona nation uh, wipe out in the genocidal process the Endebele nation? What, what, you know, what are we thinking about here when we're thinking about this process of nation state formation, which is both a sort of Weberian and a Gramscian uh, perspective, because we have hegemonic construction, the construction of consent, the balance between consent and coercion, and we have good bureaucracies, which is, I think, the kind of overemphasized um, um, good governance discourse, right? Create good bureaucracies, uh, don't be corrupt, Forget about corruption in the history of the rest of the world. Um, you know, uh, have democracy. Can we have democracy overnight? Kind of like what, what we kind of thought might happen after 1989. So that's the third one. The Holy Ghost is democracy, participation. Participation in everyday forms of life, ranging from family structures to, to, uh, uh, to, to the state, right? So that's my sort of glib idea of how we might go about um, constructing a theory that could relook at development studies, political economy. And I guess, and of course, the historical changes that are going on here is kind of where all of my archival and, um, and interviews come in to the book, looking at Mugabe and looking at, it's, for me, I have a pivotal point, um, which is in the, in the middle of, of the liberation war camps, the guerrilla camps in Mozambique, and this is where generation and ideology, I think, become important is when a, a young, a group of young Turks kind of came up in the process of after to tables assassination, uh, efforts of detente because Mozambique and Angola were already, uh, had already uh, fallen off the colonial map and were apparently in the hands of the Soviet Union. So all of, all, in the midst of all of that, a young group comes up 
at the time when Mugabe is also coming up out of prison. So there's kind of a vacuum there and these young guys have taken over the war and they're quite, quite, quite smart, read a lot of Marxism, were sort of struggling with Maoism and Soviet ideas. They were trying to unify the two armies. They were seen eventually as too much of a challenge for Mugabe. So he persuaded or, or Michelle was persuaded by other means to throw them into prison. So they were, I think to, to me, that was kind of a pivotal moment in the way Mugabe how, learned how to deal with these problems, throw the real troublemakers out and make deals with, with other aspiring members of the elite who are probably a little bit closer to you in age. And that went on and on and on throughout um, in, until he died. So after that pivotal moment, and you know, I make no apologies, but these guys were my heroes. So I'm sort of, you know, I'm biased. Um, and they were actually introduced to me through what, what my supervisor of my PhD at the time, John Saul had suggested because he had been sort of uh, alerted to this, this group of young people by Samora Michelle before Samora Michelle decided to go another way. Um, but post 1980, I think, the book, um, have you ever heard of the bottom Meinhof syndrome? So there's been things happening around you for a long time, but something twigs. Oh yes, that's been going on for a long time. Yeah, 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 I remember now the bottom Meinhof thing in Germany. Yeah, it's happened, you know. That happened to me when the coup happened. I thought, oh my, there's actually been a lot of incipient, incipient uh, alleged, fake, um, um, destroyed coups throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, especially the 2000s when the invasions uh, of, of land took place and, you know, crisis, crisis, crisis hit. So I think that's how it begins and that how, that's how it ends. And we're finished. All right. I won't say anything more. All right. Well, thanks, uh, David. I'm going to immediately move to uh, the respondents. Are you asked, uh, can we, can you come in from online? Sure. Can you hear me? Can we can't hear, hear you. You Just can't hold hear on you. a second. All right. I, I'm not muted. Hello. Oh dear. Is yours not on? Uh... I am here. Okay, let's go. We can hear you. You can hear me. Okay, great. Excellent. Well, you know, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, to attend this, although it feels a bit odd because I can't even see anybody. All I can see is a cover image of your book, David. You've lost video. You've lost video. Well, maybe that's good. Maybe You've you lost video. I'm so sorry. That's Our fine. tech guys have gone home. <laughs> I guess that means I can't be seen either, which is kind of no, a relief. We can see you. Please go ahead. <laughs> right. Um, David, I mean, one of the things I should, as a general point, I should make is, is how much I have enjoyed working with David over the last few years and how much of this coincided exactly when he was writing and rewriting and finishing this book. Um, and because I was finishing another book at the same time, we had these kind of endless coffee and cigarette fueled conversations around, around both our books. And one of the things that strikes me I can hear somebody whispering. <laughs> Go ahead, Lewis. My apologies. You can hear me, can you? Yes. Okay. So what I wanted to say, and this is a kind of general, general point, really, uh, and 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 I guess David, um, it's it's a sort of a praise of David, really, is you know David comes from a very particular um, theoretical angle uh, within Zimbabwean studies. Um, and he comes from a very different discipline from my own. Um, and yet, you know, and so with David's fascination with Gramsci um, and his kind of political, pol political approach, I guess, it's very different from my own <clears throat> anthropological background and my own interest in theories of stuff and materiality. And yet we've had these endless conversations that really were very productive for me and I, and I hope for him. Um, and, I, and I think it's a sign of, of a great scholar, actually, of someone who can engage with other scholars working in very different uh, 
lines of thought and yet have this kind of endlessly mutually beneficial conversations. And our conversations turned a lot around history and around legacies and not history as in necessarily sort of as defined and disciplined by historians, but rather history as in how does the past constantly reappear and shape the present? And that in a sense is, is what, what David's book is about. And he asks very difficult questions around, well, what is the role then of someone as uh, smart and as erudite, but also maybe as nasty as Mugabe? Even Mugabe's mother thought that Mugabe was nasty, which is, I just saw that in, uh, in David's book the other day when I was rereading it. And, and so we, we talked about this a lot. And so I have a question actually, uh, for David, um, if he can hear me, because, and I think we have talked about this, but I don't think I've ever had a satisfactory answer from you. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. It, I think one of the oddities of Zimbabwean politics is that it always seems so stuck in the 1970s. Zimbabwean politics is, it's like it's never left the 70s. It just endlessly recursively returns to to, to what happened in the 70s and with all the different versions and so on. And I guess one of my questions in this re regard is, you know, David, do you think that this is a result of Mugabe's kind of politics? A result, if you want, of Mugabeism, whether deliberate or not? Or is it rather the conditions within which Mugabe became such an astute player for such a long time until he could no longer play as well as he played before? So that's a question I have for you, David, and I hope you can give me an answer. Um, and I guess it relates to Habib's larger question of, about, you know, and the larger issue of, you know, can we imagine, um, can we imagine a, a kind of African mode of political production? And then within that, what then is the role of scholars? If, if the, you know, if the stuff of politics is really the stuff of the past, what are, what are scholars supposed to do with this? And, and again, in Zimbabwean studies, this is really acute, a really acute issue because Zimbabwe's big, you know, ZANU-PF's big players, they're all obsessed with biographies and autobiographies. And, and very often, as we all, I think, know, very established and very serious scholars get sucked into this process of writing quite dubious biographies or autobiographies or ghostwriting for Zimbabwean politicians which I think doesn't do their careers any good in the long run, but unless of course they're trying to make a career as politicians. And so what then is the role of scholars doing history or doing stuff, subjects related to history as both political science and anthropology are uh, in this very, very fraught historiographical field? I mean, if this is a, a big question and one that I think people who've been working on and watching Zimbabwe for the last couple of decades uh, will be very aware of because even people like Terence Ranger were acu acutely aware of this, uh, their own role in it, but also reflecting upon it. Um, that was one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing I kind of wanted to, to suggest to you is while I was listening to, to, to both of you speak, I, I was wondering, you know, to what extent is Mugabe, at what point or to what extent was Robert Mugabe ahead of the game? I, I think in some ways he was. I mean, certainly in terms of what's going on in Zimbabwe now, the post-coup world, I mean, everybody seems to endlessly try and do Mugabeism, but no one else can do it as well as he did. But we can also think more broadly across the region. Um, you talked about how neoliberalism has is, is become so sort of the norm that no one can think of any alternative. But one of the things that strikes me within that broader frame is that nationalism seems more normal, more normalized than ever, which is very surprising for somebody whose kind of academic background comes from the 90s when the first thing we did, you know, at Edinburgh as anthropology students was deconstruct the nation. But the nation seems more solidified and more exclusivist and more problematic than ever. Um, and, and you could certainly argue that what's going on in the UK with the sort of fetishization of the Queen's death is part of that. 
but we could also talk about how say digital technologies reify putting people in place and the place that they're put into is nations and i think mugabe in a sense produced this kind of swing to to the right way before everybody else across the region was doing it and indeed across the world there's much that Mugabe's kind of politics that seems echoed in South Africa now, that seems echoed across the region, but also in the kind of post-2010 situation in the UK, in the, in the States. I mean, the kind of normalization of what used to be understood as quite right-wing um, views is, is quite surprising. And in a sense, Mugabe was a decade or two, at least a decade ahead of everybody else there. So I want to kind of throw that out there and I'd like to hear a response from you, David. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Just. I'm going to immediately move um, to Hamad Zaripi. Um, again, you have three, four minutes, Hamad Zaripi. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I, I, I started out one of the first, as somebody who is somewhat interested in Gramsci as an undergraduate, I read, um, I found David's papers and, and the only person who really seemed to be speaking about Zimbabwe through this Gramscian lens was David. And so I've been grateful to sort of continue working and now to have this opportunity to speak at, about this book. And for me, I'm sort of asking, what does Gramsci have anything? What, what does Gramsci have to do with this? You know, because that's what I had to ask myself. And I think that's what a lot of people ask. And I think Gramsci is decidedly a uh, structuralist. I mean, even to the extent to which Gramsci spoke about anything Machiavellian, the political party is the prince. So, so everything sort of lies within this sort of broad, um, very structuralist approach, but with an emphasis on ideology. And I think this does bring us a little bit to, to the questions that, 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 that David deals with in, in, in the book, which is um, from a sort of methodological, theoretical point of view is, how, what, what, what Adam asked, how did Mugabe survive so long? How did Mugabe come to power in the first place? And what were the structures that allowed for that to happen? And I think sort of from what Adam is, from what Yost just mentioned about, we're starting to see the same patterns, not only in Africa, but, but outside of Africa where individuals are able to influence broad groups of people through, I mean, to the extent to which Mugabe was ideological, to these days, if you if, if YouTube is the is the repository of Mugabe's sort of intellectual uh, contribution, is in sort of right wing zingers again, the like homophobic zingers or racist zingers or all this sort of stuff, which doesn't which which luckily Gramsci left a very broad definition of what an of what an intellectual is and what a and what and what a uh, yeah. And, and similarly, there'll, there'll be a lot of sort of right-wing intellectuals globally who are influential, even though they've never written a book, which Mugabe never did either. Um, so I, I, what I'm trying to bring it around to is this idea of, of the structures. And the structures that, that Mugabe was able to navigate and the way that I see it, especially to the broad idea of what Adam, what Adam brought about, about how, how did Mugabe survive so long, is that Mugabe, Mugabe's first coup was in prison. And prisons, the, the, the politics of prison is a specific kind of thing. And only dictatorships and authoritarian states allow for that kind of prison politics, which isn't politics at all, is conniving and manipulating and, and, and finding angles around allows for this sort of individual sort of politics to take place. And I think that's something that's worth taking into consideration. Uh, that ultimately Mugabe continued to interact within a prison of a handful of individuals right up until he upset the wrong people at the very last day with the help of his wife and eventually the prison politics got him. Um, and through all of this, there's the Gramscian sense then of like, the rest of us have to live through this. So maybe unlike a, a British citizen who might not necessarily have been aware that they, sort of daily aware that they lived in Queen Elizabeth's United Kingdom. As somebody who was born in Zimbabwe, 
after Mugabe came to power. You're very aware that you live in Mugabe, Zimbabwe. It's very nice that he lets us live in the place, really, to be honest. Um, and the, it's, it's just this idea of the Mugabeism is more of an override, in a Gramscian sense, is an overriding culture that takes over a place that has both consent elements to it and coercive elements to it, has, is, is very much about the structure and is very much about the base. You know, and, um, and the hegemony of Mugabeism is a strange sort of thing because it has an appeal across Africa. Uh, it, it echo, it, it has a similar appeal perhaps uh, as, as, as Putin's hegemony might have right now in, in Russia or any similar sort of uh, right-wing sort of hegemony, which is based on sort of pettiness and pointing at others and while, while maintaining power through brutality. Um, so it's sort of, I, I, I do think that also one big theme in this for me is, is a betrayal of ideological positions. The, the point that Mugabe was at ever any point really ideological is, is I, I just don't see any backing for it. Like the ideology was always, of course, in the interest of power, whether, it, and, and, and the betrayal of the Vashandi movement in particular, whether or not, I mean, of course, will always be seen as, as a sort of, um, counterfactual view of history is whether or not if these young fellows of the time had been able to uh, be ascendant and, ga and gain their hegemony within the sort of uh, the nationalist movement, whether or not Zimbabwe might have been different. One might ask a similar question about whether or not if the labor movement had been more powerful in the forming of the MDC, uh, the opposition in Zimbabwe might have been more different. So the way I sort of see it is Yes, while, yeah, look, it's very difficult to have an analysis of one individual within the framework of, uh, of Gramsci, uh, but, but there is a lot to take from Gramsci. Gramsci himself was in prison, was not trying to provide a very strict uh, methodological space, uh, and is also the reason why Gramsci's name is used in, in sort of in vain in a lot of the culture wars arguments that we seem to be having across the world now. But it was also interesting to see Yost talking about these things that that became so how we understand um, uh, uh, Mugabe, this idea about uh, his, his own mother hates him. Maybe it's his Catholicism. Maybe it's the torture that happened to him in prison. You know, we always end up back in Mugabe's psychology. And for me, it's about sort of, that's what happens when, when you don't have the structures in place that allow for democratic politics. The psychology of the dictator, the psychology of the most hegemonic, the most powerful person, then becomes the central element. And like there's so many books that I'll try to sort of psychoanalyze Robert Mugabe and he wouldn't be the only one who people write about like that. Um, so I don't know if that's at all helpful, but uh, I, I, I did find it very interesting to situate it within the sort of Gramscian arguments and how they apply and don't actually apply. And yet and yet I, I see a lot in, 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 David's, in David's work about these bigger debates. I think that's that's a useful uh, spot to to stop at, Ahmad. It's uh, I think a really interesting debate. I mean, I'm 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 toying with the idea: was Mugabe a successful Machiavellian, or was he a failed Gramscian? And 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 that's the the interesting project that I think question that is implicitly emerging. Let me move uh, to Tinash. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you, David, for a wonderful read. Um, I enjoyed the book. Um, I guess I just I want to talk about two things. Um, you you open the book with quite a very strong dismissal. Um, uh, you say that the coup that started this study transformed Lito in Zimbabwe, um, and yet so many things happened in November twenty seventeen. Um, the arrangement of the furniture changed cracks emerged so that the light could get in and millions of young people sang and danced in a way they could not before. A generation's repressed joy burst into street parties. Young people screamed and draped flags over their shoulders. They gathered in groups to celebrate the end of Mugabe who had presided over their misery, which was characterized by job losses, record high inflation, company closures, and an iron fist rule that trampled on human rights and property rights. The infrastructures that enabled and facilitated civic life had been radically constrained. 
or completely destroyed. After the coup, there, was this, there has been this huge pent up demand from so many years of repression and, and censorship. A generation that had been born under Mugabe's dictatorship could not, could for the first time ask questions about themselves and their pasts beyond the specter of his figure. Why is this important? Mugabe's hold on Zimbabwean imagination for almost four decades necessitated the creation of a new set of questions, new practices and methodologies that might allow us to harness the inventiveness and generative resilience of Zimbabwean society. This is, in my opinion, ignored in your book. A whole generation is not made legible. It is not written into history. I find that a bit um, uh, unfortunate because this is also a book about generations. As you put it, generational issues are, are, now relevant, are now relevant. And yet this generation that's dancing on the streets is missing in the pages of your book. This is also a dense book. And as an archive more, I was a bit envious, but also concerned that the archive is not within, but without. Where is the nationalist archive? What is Mugabe's archive? How, how do we write Zimbabwean history after Mugabe? How do we move away from speculative readings of a country? Archive, the archives that are referenced in the book are not in Southern Africa. They're not in Zimbabwe. How does a new generation of young black scholars encounter them so they can read and interpret them on their own terms? How do we decolonize the archive? And when do we repatriate this archive? dispersed around the world? How do we make new knowledge about Zimbabwe? When you, when you opened your remarks, uh, David, you, you said this book is about one person. And sometimes when, I, when I'm reading about Mugabe, I feel like he, he continues to succeed. Even in death, Mugabe does not want his own version of history to be contaminated. I feel like there's a way in which this history perpetuates Mugabe's idea of history. He wanted to be remembered as defiant and singular. I think this is the, the final lesson of Robert Mugabe. History is an invention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tanash. Let me move on immediately to Mandipa. Tanashi, thank you for giving me more time. That was very succinct and poignant. Um, mine is to comment on the richness of the book from a ruling elite military relations and political economy of governance perspective. When we started tonight, Professor Habib asked the question, how did Mugabe survive? And how do we do things differently in structuring government? You know, one of my answers as I just on the spot thought of this is, you know, as, as the discussion has come on, you know, we, we've spoken about how we are stuck in the 1970s or Zimbabwe's politics are stuck in the 1970s. And one of the reasons that it, in my opinion, has never left the 1970s is because transitional justice and its pillars have not been respected as tenants of violence have become systematically entrenched in Zimbabwe. You look at 2009 with the government of national unity, you know, the book alludes to Tendai BT talking about how possibly good governance could be coming around finally, but those tenants continued to disregard transitional justice issues. You know, what are we talking about when we're talking about transitional justice? We're talking about its four pillars, truth seeking, prosecution, reparations, and institutional reforms, none of those have ever been addressed in Zimbabwe. You know, so if Zimbabwe is really to seek transition out of authoritarianism, um, this purported legacy of Mugabeism, there are impediments in the culture of militarization that hamper prospects for non-recurrence that we need to address first and foremost. You know, the first impediment is that maintaining a culture of authoritarianism and elitism relies on secrecy, you know, and of information, as Duval would note. Um, such secretive information that reveals plans for extraction, perpetration, and actors involved, and indeed this prison politics that has been brought up in the conversation today must be made public and perpetrators must be held accountable. And 
this just has not been done in Zimbabwe and this is how Mugabe has survived. You know, you look at section 96 to 98 of the constitution gives immunities and protections to the, um, to, to the executive in this regard. You know, so when we look at governance and how governance should be in a state like Zimbabwe or in Africa in general, we're looking at three concepts or three tenets here. We're looking at legitimacy, effectiveness, and security, which need to be upheld as three dimensions for effective governance and in prospects to, to ensure um, social cohesion and growth. And, you know, this can cannot be done or social cohesion and growth cannot be achieved if one or two of those tenants is warped. And in Zimbabwe, as we've learned from the book and indeed from understanding Mugabe's legacy in other fora, you know, the political settlements that have formed a, as a result, um, much like feudalism, um, take a long time to die. You know, the book says that um, in March 2018, as Mugabe seemed to be inventing a new party to restore his throne, the Zimbabwe independent reporters asked him if he had brought the military into politics and what has happened um, to him um, and whether that is logical, whether what happened to him was logical. You know, Mugabe is quoted to have never seen the coup coming though. Um, and he is quoted, um, speaking to education and how, you know, this is not how we educated the military people. Um, yet what should not be forgotten is that corruptibility through a culture of clientelism, which is essentially corruption, is not only problematic, but it reflects a wider systemic crisis in government in which poverty and a lack of education not only make people vulnerable to be corrupted, um, but shed a sort of unconscious loyalism um, through which deference to authority cannot give rise to a fair-minded voice. And this is exactly what happened in Zimbabwe if we're talking about survival. Um, and it then becomes as a form of elite survival rather than service and fostering pathways to accountability through transitional justice and civil political education. And so the unfortunate consequence um, of Mugabe's legacy is a narrow, non-inclusive political settlement. And when power is shifted, um, there is an assumption of a new formation of political settlements with bargaining elites. But as we all know, and we can see from the current legacies today in Zimbabwe, when those bargaining elites read from the same page in a book, there is a problem. And, um, you know, as the book has shown, legacies of securitized states and securitized elites in those states um, perpetuate legacies of flawed institutional mismanagement, um, which accumulation itself and self-interest are entrenched here. So a lack of social cohesion where mythicizations of nationhood and state formations exist and a subsequent lead notable lack of development, which Zimbabwe continues to face today. And in wrapping up, um, from the post-1987 period, this overarching shortcoming um, of the elite settlements in Zimbabwe showed a lack of reconstruction strategies that would have forged human security developments and healthier civil military relations. Unfortunately, um, Bourges is quoted in the book um, in one of the chapters, in one of the opening chapters as saying, for the kleptocrat ruling by licensing theft rather than seeking consent, money can achieve most of what needs to be done for everything else there is violence and this is the sad story of Zimbabwe in a nutshell you know I I, I, I borrow from Ball um, Fayemi um, Professor Fumni Oli uh, Ono Nisakin um, who is the vice president at King's College currently um, Williams and Dr Martin Rapier who already in 2003 understood this um, and the potential, this culture, which supported um, this Mugabeism or infectious nature of Mugabeism was 
at um, in Africa and possibly in the world. They note that one of the major impediments to security sector reform and transformation in Africa and indeed Zimbabwe, that's my own addition, have been the unwillingness of heads of state and government to accept the need for improvements in security um, in security sector governance. And a major reason that the unwillingness has been the dependency of these leaders on the security forces for their positions of power, again, speaking to this political settlement, and hence their economic well-being, again, speaking to this concept of accumulation and self-interest. So institutional reform and political settlements, um, transitional justice, while well, institutional reform as a tenant of transitional justice and political settlements that inform political cultures were crucial to to the survival of Mugabe. Thank you very much. Um, and then finally, Roger uh, Sato, uh, I presume he's going to come on. Is Roger not with us today? Sorry? He hasn't managed to get through. Okay, he hasn't managed to get through. Then it seems to me what we can do is come back to the audience. Uh, there's been a series of questions posed to you, David. Can I suggest you hold it? I want some if you like, rub some questions, reflections, thoughts from the audience, and then we'll come back as a as a final uh, uh, situation, uh, and then we'll come back for some final reflections. I do you. get the last word. You will get the last word. I promise you. Uh, anybody who wants to come in? Yes, please. Thank you, David. Um, Sorry, can I just give you the mic so that our audience online can hear you? Sorry? Can I give you this mic so that the audience online can hear you? Can you just identify yourself? Yeah, my name is Bob Shanton. Okay. Um, to what extent would you hold the liberation support movements of the 70s, 80s, which some of which John Saul, your mentor, was involved in, and I in a peripheral way. To what extent would you hold them responsible for um, the non-democratic uh, role of Mugabe and company in Zimbabwe politics? The tolerance, the refusal to actually ask serious, important questions, uh, which I think went under the heading of uh, uh, was not not raising these questions because we give aid and comfort to the other side. Okay, that's a question. Anybody else? Nobody. Can I pose a question? Then, right. Um, I was struck by. I mean, I really think that the interesting thing about what you said was, um, what was the Mugabe project? And there's been two notions or two uh, personality exemplars that have been, one has been Machiavellian, it's been mentioned, and the second is Gramscian. And it, you starts this question by saying, was Mugabe just a clever bloke in the 1970s or did he find himself in a set of social conditions? And in a sense, the real project in the 70s became how do you unravel systemic conditions which are decided, decidedly against the possibilities of inclusive development? That really what you find yourself as is an unequal world with land redistribution, land is constructed in particular ways and political power constructed in particular ways. And the political elements coming to power are seen as how do we unravel this situation? So is that the project of Mugabe, a Gramscian project of, if you like, engaging in a set of reforms under very decidedly uh, uh, difficult conditions, which would have a snowballing logic to enable a, a never ending inclusion? Was that the project? Uh, or was the project a clever bloke who came to political power who just wanted to remain in political power? A Machiavellian part. I want to keep power for its for its own sake. Which of these projects is there? And I asked this question for two reasons. Because in a sense, I think we've lurched between them. The debate on Mugabe is, 
is a Machiavellian personality who just wanted to be in power, whatever the cost. But if you listen to the South African political elite in the late 1990s and early 2000s, they, for whatever reason, they came to that. Their view was, this was somebody who was embarking, they wouldn't use the word Gramscian project, but a Gramscian project, but failed in that prospect. And there's a beautiful letter by Mbeki, ironically, in the late 1990s, written to Mugabe, saying the way you're going about this is the wrong way. Here's the way you go about it, not this way. Now, whether you agree with him is there's a belief that there is something there. So I wanted to pose that question because I think it comes from yours. I think it comes from a range of, of colleagues that 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 Hamad uh, mentions it in some ways. And, and Mandipa, you come to it in particular ways, et cetera. And I think your question about why are the, this new generation written out of the box poses that question. The second reason I pose it is because it seems to me is it has lessons for far beyond Zimbabwe. Because our systemic conditions and the political project globally seems to me is how do you unravel systemic conditions in a manner that enables further inclusion? And frankly, if that's a Gramscian project, the problem is most Marxists don't understand Gramsci. When they articulate Gramsci, they think they advance solutions as if they're in power and they warn state power and they control all forms of power. But the entire project of Gramsci was you don't control all the levers of power. And what it is, is in Saul's famous words, is it's a never ending for a suite of reforms that have an inclusive logic to them. And frankly, that debate is just missing in this contemporary. Decision. So I pose that because it's not a Zimbabwean question. That's then as much a UK question. Frankly, it's definitely a South African question, but it is as much a Brazilian and other questions that confront. And it seems to me that's not a policy debate. It's a real debate about political strategy. And that debate is missing in the country. So I wanted to pose that in a kind of provocative way, coming from where colleagues are, to pose that. Is Mugabe a Machiavellian? Or was he a failed Gramscian? And what lessons of this failed Gramscian, if that's where you think he was, hold for all of the buggers trying to build inclusion today? And that, I think, is a global debate. So, your final words. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Bob, I, I think there were, I'll start with a sim, with a, <laughs> I think there were always these debates going on in the anti-apartheid movements, the uh, solidarity movements, um, and, you know, to, to, to what extent, um, they would be embedded in a particular group within a broad, the broader nationalist movements and, and so on. So I think those debates were always going on. And I think possibly uh, the, well, if we look at Gokorohundi in, 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 in particular, um, you go to the archives and, and you just find, you know, the British state being, hey, let's, let's give this thing a chance, you know, if we, go too far against Mugabe, well, you know, the North Koreans will do everything, or the Soviets will um, uh, take over, or um, we, it, it, it'll, it'll take away from the possibilities for a decent future in, in Namibia or South Africa. There were the, so those, those, those kind of, okay, let's just kind of hold back for a while, where they're on in, 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 many, in, in many spheres of uh, states and, and civil society. Um, one could, well, I, that's where I'll stop for that. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, and I think as, as we go, we go back to that that interview that you quoted from the Zimbabwe Independent in nineteen uh, March twenty eighteen, as as the journalists were asking Mugabe. Aside from 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 what you note there, there seems to me, and I think this is recurring in the book as well. This 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 kind of naive belief that Mugabe had that the politicians and the soldiers 
we're, 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 well, we're different. The politicians should be able to control the soldiers. We have politics, we have the gun. They're different things. And that's not very Gramscian. That's like really liberal. That's like idealism. Um, and that also comes in with, with uh, the, I, I, the, the book about um, Salman Majuru, Majuru, the kingmaker. Um, where does politics begin and, and, and the military end? Or, you know, it's, and there's this, this idea that there should be um, a big gap, but there isn't. They're, they're in, in, in intertwined, which is the Gramscian thing, coercion and consent. And I guess, um, well, you know, the subalterns are um, uh, non-commissioned officers, right? All that, that military language is there in Gramsci. So I don't think he really intended to have us a gradual Gramscian project, but I don't think he was a very good Machiavellian either. I mean, I was told when I was a university student, I really shouldn't study much theory because I'd never get a job. So I ended up, you know, studying Zimbabwe for the rest of my life. But I'm listening to Machiavelli now as I sort of shuffle jog around. And Machiavelli on popular sovereignty is pretty uh, um, um, careful and and really, you know, you've, you've got to work with the people. So it's, it's not, you know, this idea of being Machiavellian is, 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 should also be Gramscian, I think. And that's probably what Gramsci took out of Machiavelli. Apparently, uh, Gramsci did uh, borrow Machiavelli from the Institute of, Deve of Development Studies, and he never gave it back. Um, so that's a, that's a sign of a, you know, you steal books from libraries, you know, no way, it's almost as bad as plagiarism. Um, so, but I think you're absolutely right in, in that this, uh, uh, the projects for reform do have to be very carefully constructed. And that's, I think, where now, now, we, now Tanesh, we're into the younger generations, right? And actually, I, <laughs> the project which, which has been delayed or maybe will never be realized is, I was working throughout what the 2000s on trying to get a study of different generations of, of uh, political actors entering and opening this political space and, and what happened. So sort of starting with the nationalists, going on with the, the, the young um, 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 challengers to the liberation movement leaders, both in, in Zipra in the March 11 movement in 1971 and, and in in um, and and with uh, the heroes of my book, and I have and I was sort of looking at the two thousands, like Tendai Beatty, and um, but I was surprised when when Mugabe died, and the people who were called up by um, uh, Stephen Curtis, uh, Sunday uh, Sunrise or whatever it is, and people like Tendai Beatty was saying, oh, he was a great leader until, so everybody kind of skipped over mm -hmm. the 1970s, mm -hmm. what was going on in there. And I, I guess you, that's because everybody skips over it. We haven't gone through that process of reconciliation beyond Gukurahundi. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Wilfred said to me was, uh, you know, I kind of said, well, what's, you know, what's the point of us talking about you guys now? And he says, well, I think the younger generation can learn something from the studies of previous generations. And I, as I, as I, as I listened to you, I kind of thought of uh, No Violet Bulawayo in her book, Glory, which is kind of a, an animal farm version of, of Zimbabwean history, which is, it was, it might win the Booker Prize. Mm -hmm. um, and you get that, that celebration with the coup, but I think it, it kind of died pretty quickly, but maybe, I think you've got a good, well, I mean, you two are good examples of it. Um, but you had the, the flag thing, which was kind of, and it was actually, <laughs> seen as a digital social media thing, but it had been planned by nurses, I think. And I mean, there was a strike going on. There was, there are some elements of a working class consciousness still there, which I think is going to be very important around the world because the workforce that Gramsci and Marx and, and trade unionists have, have relied upon for so long for social democracy anywhere. And for, I think as Hammer was saying, the origins of the MDC, it was a working class base uh, with fourth industrial revolution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what do we do with that even in advanced capitalist countries combined with this kind of never quite resolved idea of what an African mode of production or political production, ide ideological production might be. 
Peter Ecke back in 1975 seems to be often quoted by decolonial theorists these days, but you can read Peter Ecke 1975 a hundred times and there's something there every time, which is about those two publics that come together in the colonial movement, but don't, in the colonial moment, but don't come together as this new post-colonial elite uh, plays both games, to the two publics. There, so, the, and that's the sort of social structure that I think one, ha one has to understand. And I think Roger was going to query me about something. What's the difference between primitive accumulation and neo-patrimonialism? Mm -hmm. Roger, you were supposed to come up with that, maybe. <laughs> because that seems to be the kind of, you know, uh, hegemonic discipline about African societies, neo-patrimonialism. Can we get around that? Um, so hopefully this will get the conversation going a bit. And uh, thank you, everybody. I guess it's time. there's a hand up. Okay. Oh, there's so two, there's hands two hands up. Hands right, up. Good, good. So we are running, uh, coming to the end. I am going to let both of you speak as final comments. And then I'll come back to David for a final minute or two. And then there's, I think there's drinks outside and there's a reception set. So we, if there's two people, three people, in between us and drinks. So let, let's go there. So I've got the questions from online, is that okay? Okay, so let's go. Um, the first question is very brief. It's where can I get the book in Harare? Um, the second are two comments and quite long. I'll try to summarize. One, British supporters of the anti-colonial struggle operated through their own lenses. Little attention was given to internal processes of the liberation movements with little accountability. Mugabe was more the inheritor of the colonial project of extractivism than a revolutionary leader leading us to a glorious future. That's from Mike Davies. And then from Louise White. I was thrilled to hear when you quite talk about prison politics because it's got a long history in the country, but we need to remember that these politics couldn't take place without some help from not just warders, but from the state that runs the prison. I could go on and on about the 1961 constitution, but I think this gives us a picture of the varieties of collaboration that went on on the ground in Rhodesia. And it, it allows for a more nuanced notion of the security state. Maybe this is just a comment. Thanks. Okay. Well, that's useful. Okay, let's come here. Um, let's get a mic. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Moore, for, for a great book and for, um, for taking the time to document your perspective. I actually first heard about you during the, um, I first read about you during the controversy about, um, about the review of um, Professor Miles Stender's book. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so my question is, um, I mean, a great book, by the way, but my question is, how do we move forward from you know, from this legacy, I mean, from this book, one can, um, we, can we, we see, you know, um, past discussed issues of new patrimonialism, uh, patronage politics, clientelism, um, institutional um, vested interest and all of that. But, and we see that there's currently a recycling of the same system of the same issues of the same, you know, ideologies that happened before especially currently in Africa, we see that, you know, they say um, the people that don't learn from their history are bound to repeat it. Um, how much have we learned from that? How do we move on from that? Especially if you look at the system, if you look at um, what's happening currently, you see that um, new patrimonialism is currently in, in play to a very large extent. How do we go from that? How do we understand these issues in a way that we address them, in a way that institutions can, you know, can be strong enough to, to um, allay or be able to stand up to individuals that try to that try to sweep power to their own benefit. Thank you. Okay, David. Final word. <laughs> I, I I was going to mention to the the generational issue, prison politics to university politics. I think a lot a lot of the the new generation, especially in the in what was the MDC and is the the, the Citizens Coalition for Change is still driven by kind of a university politics, which may or may not um, be a good thing. Um, 
certainly I think some of the debates in the universities in, in the 80s were pretty good. I mean, you had the kind of Trotskyist movement come in with people like Rehad Desai and uh, um, and, and a, the challenging the sort of uh, scientific socialist ideas. There was a lot of ferment going on there, much like in the camps in the 1970s. And I don't know enough about those, if those debates are really circling around in like your generation, I'm not sure. Um, and I, I think a, a point that uh, that Tanash raised is getting at the archive. Um, in the early 80s, the, the archive, the National Archive was e easy to go to, and it was good. I think it's deteriorated a lot. So there's, you know, that 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 I, that 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 uh, um, um, source of history has to be revived, and the ZNPF archives. I think there, I and mean, there are still, okay. We we may be. Who was it? Was it? You was talking about the nation. I'm not sure if Mugabe built this idea of the nation. I mean, the West Kokundi was hasn't which hasn't hasn't been resolved. Has. And I think there may have been a deterioration of that as what Arthur Mutambara in his forthcoming third volume of his autobiography is saying, Zimbabwe has gone down to village politics. It's village accumulation. So these networks of accumulation are shifting in non-national ways. And I think that's a thing that uh, has to be challenged in, in, a, in a national popular way. Hammer, I wanted you to talk more about historic blocks and how do we understand how the shift in, in after the coup leads to a new historic block, which Gramsci encourages us to study and Hammer's thesis is about it. Um, and how do we go forth from an analysis of what a new historic block is forming to the possibilities for progressive change? post-COVID, is there a super sort of new Keynesian economic uh, uh, ideas that can come about, like which did come about after the decolonization moment, but have been destroyed by how many years of, of Thatcherism and hyper-liberalism? Um, those are some sort of starting points, I think, for rethinking, uh, for restarting. I mean, we are at a moment, we're at a restart, I think, globally, as well as Finally, the words of David Sanders, who I first met in 1984 at that conference at, at, at Rope. He's quite famous for saying, Zimbabwe's a trailer, South Africa's the movie. All right, so uh, colleagues, that brings us to, I think, a useful end. I think there's lots of uh, further conversation to be had. I'm sure some of it will happen outside over drinks. Uh, and then I'm sure there'll be many more opportunities. I should say, uh, firstly, thank you uh, to David for uh, doing this book, for uh, uh, partly because whether you agree with it entirely or not, it enables a conversation. And it's precisely the conversation that is required. Uh, secondly, to many of the, uh, the colleagues, all of the respondents, Tinash, but also the colleagues in uh, online uh, who, who, who made themselves available. Thank you for your valuable comments. Uh, I think I speak on behalf of the Royal African Society and so as that it's wonderful uh, to have this kind of debate and discussions. We are emerging in a post-COVID moment. We're still not sure what form that will take, but what we do need to return to is greater, deeper deliberation. Because the thing that worries me about this moment is if we are looking for an inclusive project, then it seems to me two things have to happen. One is nuanced conversation, not crude, nuanced conversation. And second is it seems to me that universities by as a, as a place for enabling ideas should be at the core of enabling that project. Uh, and that's what we should be talking about. So with that, thank you very, very much. Please enjoy it. Join us for the reception. Thank you.